The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. Thank you, Mr. Affleck. Thank you very much. It's an honor to sit here in this room and speak before you great senators. Thank you both very much for having me here. I'm humbled by this esteemed panel. <clears throat> um, thanks for having me follow the greatest and most important philanthropist in the history of the world. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to come off great. You're uh, welcome. <laughs> but uh, no, truly, it's an honor to sit next to, to Mr. Gates, who's done such extraordinary things in, in technology and in philanthropy. And I understand on your way to doing so in Bridge. All right. Not there yet. Um, <laughs> Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Leahy, distinguished members of the committee, I want to thank you deeply for inviting me to testify here today. Um, my name is Ben Affleck. I'm, I'm the founder of uh, the Eastern Congo Initiative. We're a grant making and advocacy uh, organization working with and for the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo. <clears throat> I want to offer a special thanks to the chairman for holding today's hearings. Uh, Senator Graham, like others on this subcommittee, has proven time and time again to be a genuine champion for smart, effective U.S. foreign assistance. Uh, in August 2013, amid renewed violence in the region. Chairman Graham led a delegation to Eastern Congo, bringing five Senate colleagues along to see firsthand the potential of the region. This marked the largest ever delegation of U.S. Senators to visit this war-torn region. So thank you, Mr. Graham, for your uh, confidence in the people of Congo and for learning more about what can be done. And to Senator Leahy, uh, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge um, my co-star in Batman, Roles marginally smaller than mine, but I understand you're quite good. <clears throat> uh, uh, good morning, sir. Members of the committee, I'm here today to offer a case study of the difference our nation's foreign assistance and diplomacy is making, where small, targeted public and private investments are transforming communities in need, advancing our nation's interests, uh, and creating opportunities, both in the countries we assist and here at home. You've undoubtedly heard a bit about Congo, about its, its challenges, and about the worst of its past. Two decades of armed conflict, estimated 5 million deaths due to violence, disease, and starvation. Uh, 2.7 million people who remain displaced today and the appalling levels of sexual violence. But these statistics tell you nothing about Congo's future uh, or about the extraordinary and resilient people working every day to rebuild their nation. Despite the many challenges, the Congolese people refuse to be defined by their country's past. And in spite of those who may question the effectiveness of our foreign assistance, I can tell you firsthand that U.S. diplomatic and financial investments in Congo are working. U.S. foreign assistance accounts for only 1% of the entire federal budget, and vastly less than 1% of that 1% is allocated to DRC. Yet from that fraction of a fraction, we are seeing important, powerful progress. Let me give you an example of what I mean. <clears throat> In the late 1970s, Congo was one of coffee's leading exporters. Uh, but because of conflict and diseased crops, production today is less than 10% uh, of, of what it once was. Congolese families lost a vital source of income, and the rest of us lost some of the world's greatest coffee. Three years ago, ECI saw an opportunity to revitalize uh, Congo's coffee sector. In our work, we'd met struggling rural farmers living on less than a few dollars a day. Uh, and we knew that with the right partners, we could get, help give them the skills and resources they need to transform their communities. And we were thrilled that USAID agreed. <clears throat> Our government made the bold decision to help us create a public-private partnership together with ECI, the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, and the Catholic Relief Services. Together in only two years, we've trained and supported 4,500 coffee farmers across four cooperatives to dramatically increase the quality and quantity of their crop and to help maximize farmer profits. We brought in global trade specialists to build an ethical supply chain that keeps money in the pockets of farmers and their families. But what we've been able to achieve together doesn't end there. Prior to ECI's involvement, these coffee farmers had no access to financing, no line of credit. Imagine trying to start a business w without any capital. You simply can't, let alone in an emerging economy like uh, Congo's. So to close this gap, we brought in the experts. We approached Scott Ford's company, Westrock Finance, which has worked alongside these cooperatives to dramatically scale their businesses in environmentally sustainable ways. Uh, I should add that Scott was part of that historic delegation with, with Mr. Graham that visited Congo in 2013. Um, the final puzzle piece was getting this coffee into American homes. So ECI brought in another investor which was Starbucks. In the coming weeks, Starbucks officials will travel to the eastern region of Congo to begin a partnership with us to develop Congo as a key source of high-quality coffee. Starbucks has already purchased 40 tons 
may not be a lot for Starbucks, but it's a heck of a lot in Eastern Congo, I assure you. It's the entirety of the cooperative's very first export, representing millions of cups of coffee that will be sold in U.S. markets. Involvement by the world's largest coffee company is a clear testament to what's possible for Congo. This isn't charity or aid in the traditional sense. It's good business. <clears throat> uh, from a relatively modest investment, farmers' incomes have more than tripled, and they can now afford to send their children to school, put food on the table, and access proper health care. As a result, the world has a new source of high-quality coffee. This public-private partnership has transformed the lives of thousands of families in Eastern DRC, all made possible because USAID agreed that it could be done. But we think this is just the beginning of what's possible. Next month, ECI will launch an economic development fund that's focused on expanding our existing work, not only in coffee, but in cocoa and other strategic crops. <clears throat> As a result of our new fund, we will work with at least 10,000 additional farmers over the next four years to build their business capacity, improve the quality and quantity of their projects, and secure direct access to premium markets. This work is scalable. This work is replicable. And in just five short years, it will have a transformative impact on nearly 100,000 individuals living in Eastern Congo. None of this would have happened without USAID, without their commitment a relatively modest commitment, I might say, and without private sector partners willing to operate in one of the highest risk environments in the world. With proper training and strategic investments, agriculture will become a driving force for Congo's economy, supporting the more than 60% of Congolese, that's 40 million people, whose families rely on agriculture as a primary source of income. Simply put, we believe that a country with enough arable land to feed a third of the world's population should not struggle to feed its own people, to send its own kids to school or for basic health care. Senators, this brings me to my final message. The next two years represent a critical turning point for DRC. With local elections scheduled for later this year and national elections in 2016, DRC enters an incredibly important window of opportunity for an unprecedented democratic transition. Direct and consistent engagement by Secretary Kerry, the Special Envoy's Office, and Ambassador Swan have helped Congo reach this moment. As you know, your former colleague, Senator Feingold, <clears throat> served as Special Envoy until it's just a few weeks ago. His leadership and the 15 trips he made to DRC uh, during his 18-month tenure was the very definition of direct and consistent diplomatic engagement, and we thank him for his service. The U.S. leadership played a vital role in the recent yet fragile progress toward peace and stability. To ensure this progress does not come undone, we urge you to join ECI and other groups like Open Society, Humanity United, Human Rights Watch, uh, and the Enough Project in calling on the administration to appoint a new special envoy without delay. Senators, if we continue to make smart and effective financial and diplomatic investments, we will help foster the next generation of Congolese entrepreneurs and leaders who will carry their country forward to stand as a model for the region and the continent. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. <clears throat> Jennifer and Violet are very proud. Very well done. <laughs> John. <laughs> 